Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome everyone. I hope you are all well. I'm Katarzyna Kubas, ITTF Continental Development Manager, and I'm very happy and proud to kindly welcome you on our 10th ITTF High Performance and Development Webinar with the topic ITTF Paratable Tennis Classification. At first, I would like to kindly inform you about our webinar code. Please mute yourself and turn off the video. Only panelists will have, have it on. Please do not touch anything related to the recording of our presentation and our presentation slides. Please leave your questions in the chat section uh, the panelists will try to answer as many as possible in the question and answer part of the webinar. Uh, thank you in advance for following this work. Moving forward, I have a great pleasure to introduce our today's panelists. Welcome to my ITPA classification officer, Alejandra Gavaglia, head coach of Argentina Para Team and Trevor here, member of ITTF Athletes Commission and 2017 Oceania Paratable Tennis Champion. Thank you very much for your support and presence on this webinar. Uh, as mentioned, we will discuss about uh, Paratable Tennis classification, which uh, support with as fair and equivalent competition as possible amongst athletes with different impairments. Therefore, last but not least, I warmly welcome our PTT events and classification manager, Pablo Perez, uh, who will be moderating the rest of this webinar and lead this interesting discussion. I hope you will enjoy today's webinar and pass over to you, Pablo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katasina. It's a real honor to share this webinar with these respected experts in the subject. Um, we know that classification is the most specific and differential aspect in parasport, and uh, it is probably also most uh, one of the most unknown. So I was really thrilled that the uh, High Performance and Development Department suggested me to moderate this educational webinar. Uh, we're very lucky to have this um, with us, these three representatives of three different groups that are very important for the classification and obviously for the, uh, for the sport, which are the players, coaches and classifiers. So we have um, one uh, expert from each one of these uh, groups and we will, um, well, we will address some questions to them and I hope that we have a fruitful uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Gu uh, from um, Taiwan. Um, he is the classification officer. He's been involved in uh, Paratible Tennis classification for more than 20 years. So he's an absolute uh, eminence in the, uh, in, the, in the topic. And um, for those of you who are not so familiar, I would like to start asking uh, Dr. Gu, um, uh, could you briefly describe the classification system and the process of classification in table tennis? Thank you, Pablo. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening around the world. Yeah, I'm Dr. Wu. Now I live in Taiwan. Everything is quite well in Taiwan. And I quickly introduce the power table tennis classification system. So can we turn on the slide? How, how, how can we see the slide? Uh, power table tennis classification system. Yes. According to the IPC code, there are three big groups of imp impairments. So for our power table tennis, we have uh, more players with physical impairments. We define physical impairments into five classes in wheelchair. This means from class one to class five. And then five classes for standing players from class six to class 10. 
We also include intellectual impairments in our table tennis. They are in class 11. However, in table tennis, we don't include players with physical uh, visual impairments. So this means no VI class in table tennis. So that's a general 11 classes for physical impairments and the intellectual impairments. And uh, we go to next slide, please. As you know, no classification, no competition. So in power table tennis, how we conduct classification? So we need to have fair and the proper classification process. So this includes two main parts. The first part is pre-competition arrangement. So this means NA, National Association or National Paralympic Committee, need to provide a medical diagnosis form and the athletes need to sign a consent form. And the, these two forms need to send to our classification manager. The manager is the chairman this section, Prabhu. So the country need to send it and the Prabhu receive it and they can register your prayers in next tournament. And the prayer come to tournament. So first they need to do classification. So they need to be tested by medical classified to do physical assessment. Then technical classifies, they will conduct technical assessment. So when classifies have physical res physical assessment and technical assessment results, the classification panel can make a first decision. What class the player should be in for competition? And the, during competition, classified panel will observe players and the, to decide whether the class is appropriate for the player. If this is not appropriate, the classification panel need to make another decision. By the end of tournament, they will give the decision to the country and the player what class the player should com compete for next event. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a general classification process. So I okay. finish a general introduction. Okay, thank you. Uh, before moving forward, I would like to remind all the participants, please, to turn off your cameras, uh, especially our friends from Austria. And um, we have uh, still a few uh, video cameras uh, on. So please, uh, in order to get a good uh, quality recording, uh, all participants, turn off your cameras, please. So uh, I would like to continue with uh, Alejandra. Um, she is the head coach of the Argentinian team. She has been also involved in para table tennis for more than 20 years. Um, so she has a lot of experience in coaching. She has been, uh, she has uh, trained new coaches in um, um, for the ITTF. And uh, well, according to your experience, um, um, all right, Chip, we got it. I just gotta get the sound on. All right. Okay. Bye. Okay. Uh, we have somebody with their sound on. Please turn off your microphone. Um, uh, we have. Yeah. Okay, Alejandra. Um, 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 according to your experience, what are the main differences that you find when you coach able-bodied athletes uh, versus para-athletes? and um, what things are not so different. So um, could you illustrate us a little bit, please? Yes, well, hello to everybody. And first of all, I'm happy to be here and to have the opportunity to promote para table tennis. That is, I think is very important. Um, what happened to me um, is that when we talk about differences, I feel like in some way why we are putting a big wall so from one side, there are uh, everybody players, and from the other side, uh, PTT players. And if, if I look at the point of the formal aspects, so the coach's perspective, uh, in the way I approach the training, or coaches approach the training, how I set up goals, how I evaluate strengths and weaknesses of my player, 
And after that, how I make the complete uh, plan of training, everything related with video analysis, mental preparation. As this is an individual sport and individualization is a fundamental principle. Looking at all these formal aspects, I cannot see differences in the way we approach the training in an everybody player and in a disabled player. Uh, next, please. The next slide. <laughs> So, if I see the athlete's perspective in the other hand, um, all these qualities and characteristics that, that are listed here, they are the same also for everybody and, and para-athletes. Uh, so, the way in they approach the training with patience, sacrifice, hard work, perseverance, commitment, discipline, that is absolutely the same. They also want to have uh, more exposure in the media, and they also want to earn more money, tournament, and, and to sponsors. And here we can find differences, but uh, these differences in media and, and to earn more money are not related to training. So they are related to other aspects of the sport. So, um, I prefer not to talk about differences. I prefer to talk about um, some key points or some aspects to consider. So that is uh, mostly for beginner coaches uh, when they want to start to train uh, adults with disabilities. So it's important accessibility uh, in the clubs, school or institution where you are doing the training, rams, bathroom doors, this is very important. Not only in the playing hall, not also in the whole building where the training is done. Medical advice is also very important to know what your player can do or can't do. So uh, to avoid, you know, risk uh, and do exercises that could be dangerous for them. Sometimes medication, uh, you have to take in consideration the medication your athlete is, is, is taking uh, because uh, maybe they can take a medication that can um, lower the blood pressure and this can, can be risky uh, during the training. Talking about risky situations, uh, also to know about uh, the specific disability of your player uh, for example, if they do not uh, have trunk balance, it's important when you plan your exercises, es es especially when you are doing uh, physical training. Uh, recovery is also very important. Some players need to do recovery in the individual uh, training session. Maybe you have to do more stops. Maybe you have to do uh, more stop than usual to uh, do some stretching exercise and then come back uh, to the training. And, the, and there are maybe some players, they can train five days a week. Um, maybe uh, some of them not because of, of the disability. Implements are also very important. You, you need uh, wheelchair-friendly tables. You know that table for wheelchair the legs, the front legs, should be 40 centimeters inside the table to avoid to hit with the wheelchair or the legs of the player, the legs of the table. Uh, it's important to have ball catchers because some, some of them cannot pick up the ball from the floor. And also we always uh, train with a lot of balls. So also for the coach, we need some ball catchers to, to do the uh, training, um, more, how can I say, uh, faster. And uh, for me, it's very important communication. Talk to your player so they will teach a lot uh, and they explain better what they can do. Um, so when observation, look and understand again what your player can do or can do. Uh, knowledge about the disability and classes is also very important. Which techniques techniques are used mostly? 
but this is not fixed because uh, even players in the in the same classes are different. So when I speak about this, I speak about generalities in classes. Um, to have the, the ability as coaches, how to adapt or transform the technique according to the strength and range of movement of the player. And to be smart, and this is linked also with observation, to propose changes in equipment. And um, not only about blades and rubbers, also we have to look, for example, at the wheelchair, for example, uh, the high in the sitting position, a more sportive or light wheelchair, how to develop devices when needed in case of an amputation in, in the playing arm, for example. Uh, now you have a lot of resources, uh, videos and pictures. Uh, you have a lot of uh, resources from internet uh, because every case is different. So uh, this is, for that reason, I put their creativity because in some way, we have to use all our creativity when, when coaching. But this is not only for uh, PTT players. For everybody players, you also have to observe, or uh, you also need to have knowledge to adapt or transform and to be creative in your, in your training. And just to finish the idea, uh, what I want to do is to encourage most uh, coaches to start working with players with a disability. Don't be afraid not to concentrate in the differences because, as you can see, there are a lot of things they have in common. Mm. Um, thank you, Alejandra. I, I, really like, um, I would really like to focus on that uh, final idea. Uh, I think it is very interesting to uh, pass that message of uh, focusing on the things that are the same uh, for able-bodied players and for uh, players with a disability. And um, obviously later, uh, coaches need to um, be creative and to uh, adapt their uh, coaching techniques and training techniques. But uh, yes, I, I agree with you. And I have heard this uh, message from other coaches that there are uh, much more things that are the same than the things that are different. Um, I would like to address the next question to Trevor Hirt. The, um, he's a para-athlete. He has been in the Athletes Commission for some time now. And, um, well, he has a big knowledge of para-table tennis. Uh, he's been player, playing for a long time. How many years now, Trevor? Uh, I've been playing since I was a very young child, but uh, for the Australian team since 2013. Okay, 2015. So uh, I would like to ask you, um, being a representative of the athletes in the Athletes Commission, I am sure that you get a lot of feedback and a lot of uh, information from the athletes regarding classification. What is the athletes general, I think, I know that this is a very general question, but uh, what is the athletes general opinion about uh, table tennis classification? Yeah, um, of course, Everyone has an opinion, um, and I do hear a lot of them uh, from many of the players around the world. So hello to anyone who's tuning in, and um, yeah, thanks um, for, for having me today. Um, I think the general opinion is everyone wants fairness. Um, that's, that's what we're aiming for. Um, I think most players accept that the current classification system is very good. Um, but always there's um, always suggestions for improvements. Um, and you'll often hear a lot of gossip, a lot of um, little little stories um, about players trying to gain an extra advantage. Um, you know, these are for the players wanting to benefit themselves, I suppose, maybe thinking that their opponent might not be um, – classified correctly. Um, it is a common um, opinion of, of players, but uh, I, I think you know, the, the players, while they're playing the sport, they are they are not the classifiers, they are not the doctors. Um, they don't have the depth of knowledge of classification. Um, so sometimes the opinions are a little bit uh, un unwarranted. Um, I always hear, you know, good suggestions about um, how to improve the system, especially 
uh, bringing in more um, evidence-based uh, medical technology, uh, which I think uh, uh, the players would love. Uh, that's something coming into the future. Um, yeah, that's some of the the real positive opinions that I that I hear from from other players. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gu, I would like to ask you, um, it is a, a common opinion that the, there are some classes that are quite homogeneous uh, and some other classes that are quite heterogeneous. The level of uh, impairment is uh, higher than in other classes. In your opinion, which are the borderline classes that you face the most challenge with? Okay, yes, this is true. I recognize this issue. So, to be realistic, we need to know there is no perfect system. Compared with many sports, I can say table tennis classification system is useful in the functional system. The system is quite stable in most classes. However, we also know that standing classes 7, 8, and 9 may not be so stable because we combine several types of physical impairments and uh, so many players in these three classes. And then this causes more complicated situation. So for example, we have CP players in class, in class seven, eight or nine in these three classes. But the general criteria for each class for CP hemiplegia may not be so clear, and that they are not easy to measure objectively. That's the reason why some players may complain, I should be in low class, not higher class. But like Trevor just mentioned, the player, you are not a doctor, you are not uh, very strong to see both sides, I mean the medical and the technical part together. I must say I'm lucky, I have a both background, medical, technical and uh, also develop the functional system. So we have a more wide perspective to try to give fair classification for players. In addition, players with leg problems in classes seven, eight or nine, the similar situation happen. But currently in power table tennis, we don't have fair objective table tennis related agility test to really measure leg movements. We can only use the muscle power, then say, okay, you are in six, you are in seven or eight or nine. But sometimes people complain, are there real class? Because players understand how much movements they need to conduct. Sometimes they don't need to move so much. So in this kind of situation, our medical and the classification committee also try to tackle these issues. For example, after research, we have developed more objective criteria in class 10 in the past two years to give clear definitions for minimal impairments in standing class. So gradually we can reduce the problems caused by human beings. We have a more clear definition, so people fit our system or they don't fit our system by objective measurements. So some of the comments may be quite wide and uh, just give you the general pictures. No system is perfect, but we classify to our best to complete <coughs> our job well. You explained before at the beginning of the uh, webinar uh, the three parts of the classification process and um, in that uh, regarding that matter I would like to ask you um, we know that uh, there is a classification uh, decision after the technical assessment and that decision could be changed after the uh, observation assessment so the question would be how often does uh, does that happen that uh, classifiers change their decision about the allocated class after the observation and what are the most common reasons for this to happen? Okay, this is a good question. 
I I think the person asked this question, he is very smart, but I need to let you know how we classify tackle this problem. Generally, I think it's not so often occurred in PTT, especially in international events. But there are two main possible reasons. We change classes after observation. First, a few players did not do their best during classification to show their abilities. But during competition, classifiers find out better performances and the abilities of players. Thus, classifiers may need to put players on the list for re-evaluation or more observation or change classes. I think the human nature still need to be considered because few players want to get easy class and get benefits to win easy medals. So we classifiers need to be careful about some people don't want to show their abilities during classification. The mm. second reason is classifiers may not make right decision or even make mistakes for a few players. We know that classifiers need a lot of experience to conduct good classifications and the proper discussions among classified panels. So if we understand the classification system well, conduct the good decision, good test, I can see most of the players are in right and the fair classes. However, we classify a few, I, I don't say many, a few classifiers may make mistakes due mm -hmm. to lack of experience that happen. So generally speaking, the duty classifies of classifiers must keep fair decision for players. Our principle in classification committee is no players can get benefits and the no players are penalized in classification. And the classifier must be fair and uh, competent. So mm -hmm. like I mentioned before, only good classification, good competition. So mm -hmm. I hope every country and the every coach is here you should tell your players when you come to classification room, do your best. Mm -hmm. And uh, this will be good for our sports to be better and strong. OK, mm -hmm. that's my comment. Thank you. I, I really think that it is uh, very honest from you to acknowledge that the uh, training of the classifier might be one of the problems. So uh, that's a good point. Then we should focus on that. We should, uh, the ITTF should work on that in the, in the present and in the near future. And um, the other reason was related to the cooperation from the players. So, uh, well, we, we, maybe we should work also in some kind of, I don't know, campaign to encourage uh, fairness on this matter. The same thing as uh, we have campaigns uh, to, um, educate uh, athletes about anti-doping, uh, maybe we should um, focus also some efforts on that area. I think that it is very interesting. Yeah. Um, Trevor, uh, you saw at the beginning the um, process of classification that uh, Dr. Wu presented to us. And um, uh, I would like to give you some uh, recommendations to uh, absolute beginners to players who come for the first time to a para table tennis competitions. Um, what would be your recommendation to an athlete who is going to be classified for the first time in an international event? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing is to know the procedure. Um, the the information is available uh, online. Uh, usually, the, the link is provided in the prospectus to the to the tournament. Um, but it, I'm sure it's also available somewhere on the um, ITTF website. Um, yeah, really important to know um, sort of what you'll be going through in the medical examination. Uh, then you'll also have the technical examination and also the observation in competition. Um, one of the things I remember when when learning about this is that, that classification, you 
you must show your true ability. Um, it's no use trying to um, play weak or pr pretend to the um, to the medical doctors or the technical experts because then it will be completely different in competition when you're actually trying your best. Um, this is um, something that the IPC is um, trying to make more aware as well. There's a lot of um, discussion um, amongst the um, in the IPC Athletes Forum about getting education out to, to this um, these new players aiming for classification. Um, I think another uh, thing, if possible, get a provisional classification within your own country mm -hmm. at um, training camps or in your own national tournaments. Um, so that way, at least you have a fair idea of what class you might be. Maybe the, the difference might change one or two. Um, but at least you have a fair idea. You can do your homework studying some other players you might be wanting to play against. So, uh, if, and if you've already gone through a provisional classification, maybe with a, a technical or medical classifier in your own country, then um, you won't be so so worried or you won't be so stressed out about um, the, the international classification. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Alejandra, um, I believe that one of the things that I um, realized when I started to be in contact with para table tennis is that uh, para athletes uh, use uh, more different tactics and sometimes a smarter game that a smarter game than able body athletes. And uh, sometimes it is because of the they are forced by the impairments. The I, uh, it is my, I think that they there are a, a much wider use of um, uh, different rubbers, different blades. Also, the uh, wheelchair, the possible uh, assistive devices, the presence of uh, a crutch or uh, some kind of uh, restriction uh, um, devices. Um, could you give us some examples of this kind of variety that we find in para table tennis that we don't find so much in able body um, in able body table tennis? Uh, yes, I think also that the plaguing style is forced mostly by the impairment. For example, I can give you some examples. There are a lot of examples, so I will reduce it in the most significant. For example, if we think at a class six player with severe problems in legs and arms. It's very difficult to them to do a very fast rally. So it's very common to see that they play, for example, with long pimples uh -huh. to slow the rally or because they cannot perform a good backhand because remember, the problem could be also in the arm. And also they have to stand uh, near the table and in the middle to be able to reach easily the corners. Remember always that we are talking about severe problems in arms and legs movements. And of course, this is not for all class six. When, when I speak, I, I'm always speaking about generalities. In the same way, it's also common to see, for example, long pimples. We can see long pimples most in, in PTT players than in able body. For example, we can see also the use of long pimples in wheelchair, in wheelchair players with problems in the trunk balance. Uh, or because they want to slow the rally uh, for their own style of playing. In class one or two, for example, in wheelchair, a light racket could be recommended because they are not so strength in the playing arm. And also some of them make an adaptation uh, to the grip to do it uh, longer. In that way, they can reach uh, shorter balls. And also in class one, we can see some blades that are a little bit bigger than the standard, uh, also to reach short balls, because sometimes one centimeter is, is a lot for a class one. And if we speak about tactics, what I think is that PTT players uh, have to maximize their resources. So they have to use all the possible positions on the table to place the ball. And for this, they have to be smart. It's, it's, it's like a different view of table tennis. And this is possible because the speed is 
slower and the rallies sometimes are longer than in Eagle Valley. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, depends on the classes, and this is most for wheelchair players and lower classes in standing players. In high classes, in standing players, it's very similar to everybody, and we have to look at everybody as an example. And what for me is amazing is to see players with severe impairments, with problems in balance and movements, and how with training they can coordinate and reach control with a very high level of play. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to remind you once again, please turn off your cameras. Uh, our friends from USA, our friends from China, please turn off your cameras. Uh, and um, and uh, I will continue with um, uh, another question, which will be a very open question addressed to the three of you, because, uh, well, I would like to receive the uh, different angles that uh, you might have uh, uh, regarding this matter. Uh, we all know that the, um, uh, in order to be part of the Paralympic Games, uh, any para sport has to have uh, some classification rules which are aligned with the IPC classification code. So the IPC requires some harmonization uh, among all sports in classification. Lately, we have uh, uh, heard about the problems that uh, wheelchair basketball is having. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have those problems in table tennis. But regarding this harmonization required by IPC, um, uh, which improvements do you think that IPC and also ITTF uh, should be working on uh, in relation to classification? Huh? Uh, that, that would be the question. We can start with uh, Dr. Wu, for example. Okay. This is not easy questions, but I try to answer in my way and also on behalf of the classification committee. So we ITTF PTT need to follow the classification code developed by IPC. I believe everyone agree with this. In addition, I think good research is needed. In the recent years, IPC proposed the evidence-based classification and the best practice model. And the ITT PTT also recognize the importance of objective and evidence-based classification. We do our best to follow the way IPC one table tennis follow. This is a very good point. So when Prabhu and I attend the, the meeting conduct by IPC, I don't hear any complaints about table tennis. So that's a very positive to see our sport in right decision. And uh, I also propose table tennis specific research is urgently needed, such as practical tests, objective data, valid testing method, and the research result can be applied in classification, especially to solve the main issues in a few standing classes, and also define the borderline for wheelchair classes. So gradually, we can see our sport has less weakness. And the, how I propose the research needed in table tennis. For example, in Taiwan, our Ministry of Science and Technology support the table tennis specific research project to help able-bodied table tennis. And the Chinese Taipei try to win some medals in Olympics and the Paralympics. And I believe the similar methods can be applied in power table tennis too. Thus, the international cooperation to use the similar methods to collect and to compare data is needed. And finally, IPC and ITTF can recognize our contribution and how we really have actions to do evidence space classification. Mm -hmm. So in the past few years, Pablo committee members and I did our best to work with IPC well regarding following the IPC rules, guidelines and the related 
activities such as we have presentation in FISA conference to show table, power table tennis have good action and how we improve our system and also process and also explain to players and the countries. I expect our power table tennis will be successful and strong as usual if everyone in our power table tennis tennis family follow our approach and uh, try to maintain fair competition and uh, no cheating and uh, everyone feel honor in the ptt family this is my comment okay uh trevor from uh, players perspective what do you think that uh, we should work on in order to improve the classification system yeah, um, I guess the the future will um, determine some new technologies to um, gather that uh, evidence based. Um, yeah, the, the the medical the medical side of things, um, but yeah, as Sheng mentioned, also the practical side of things. Uh, we we don't really have too many tests to measure the the strength of playing a stroke um if that can be used with some more technology that would be amazing um so i think that's something to look forward to in the future um yeah we have a lot of research going on into um physical impairment and into uh, intellectual impairment i think there is some, some studies happening around the world uh, certainly one in, in australia um I think yeah, it's a good sign from across that's across IPC or all, all sports that um, they're looking to bring in uh, more technological advancements. Um, I also think um, that education um, is quite important um, to bring everyone's sort of knowledge up to the same level, um, easy access to that education um, for everyone inside the sport and also the general public um, if especially at major events like um, the paralympics or world championships when the general public is is watching if there's readily available um, information about the classification that's 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 quite good and modern then i think that goes a long way to um, sort of e easing people's minds about the differences of impairments and different types of players because there's such a wide range of um, disabilities within table tennis. Yeah. Um, Alejandra, from the uh, coach's perspective, have you uh, discussed this with other coaches? What um, could we improve in this area? Uh, Alejandra, uh, you are muted. Uh, we cannot hear you. So it's, uh, yes, uh, it's not when we discuss between coaches, we discuss uh, all the time about if a player is good, is good classified or not. So, but if we think about classification, because I was also a classifier, I think it's it's really a very sensitive topic because it's related directly with level the playing field. Is is related with the fair play. Uh, so it's important to. Uh, ITTF to put more focus here. Also because uh, what I see is that the number of players and, and countries uh, are increasing year by year. And in the same way, classification should be more stronger. So we need more classifiers, we need more classifications, we need more reviews, and we need more education, as Trevor uh, said, to all, to players and to coaches. Uh, and I think, and this is very personal, I think the area should be more professional. And I'm, and I'm thinking that is an area that needs more budget from ITTF, because it's like the players and countries are growing very fast, and classification cannot do it as faster in the, in the practical way, you know, to, to avoid all these discussions. I, I really know that the classifiers are doing a great job, and they work so hard, but and they need more um, a help from ITTF to continue with this job. Mm -hmm. 
Well, th those were those were very good points. Uh, more research, uh, more education, and the last topic that Alejandra mentioned: uh, professionalization of classifiers. It is a matter that it's been in the agenda of the IPC in the last um, not very long, in the last four or five years, I would say. And um, I I predict that it will become a reality. Uh, quite soon because, um, well, it happens in all the areas or the, the rest of the officials are because uh, as the sport becomes more professional, all the officials should become uh, professionals. And uh, I think that we will go there and it is um, oh, it's very interesting that the general feel of the uh, coaches and some of the players go goes also in that sense that we should uh, move forward towards the uh, progressive uh, professionalization of the classifiers. Um, well, I have uh, also one question which is not uh, specifically related to classification, but I think um, it is very interesting also for the para table tennis family. And uh, it is about the, part the participation of the female players. So I would like to ask uh, Trevor and Alejandra uh, uh, from their perspective. Um, we know that um, we have less women in para table tennis in comparison uh, to the men. And uh, if you have any uh, ideas or suggestions on how we could uh, close this gender gap in para table tennis. You, you could start, Trevor. Um, yeah, this is... Um uh, a topic we've discussed uh, quite a lot in um, the Athletes Commission and also within para table tennis. Um, I think uh, in the future it's all about creating more opportunity um, for for female players um, and uh, some of the ideas uh, thrown around is the introduction of possible mixed doubles going forward mm -hmm. uh, that will um, Ensure that countries will be entering more more female participants into the the tournaments, um, and also I think the opportunities, uh, especially in world tournaments, often the the numbers of um, the women's classes are are low and the the classes are mixed, so it really um, disadvantages the lower classes. Example um, from from class six, seven, and eight, all combined for a regional championship, it um, really disadvantages the, the lower class. So I think some maybe st structural changes could be brought forward to give those um, those classes more opportunity to compete on that um, level playing field. And hopefully that will encourage um, even more of the countries to, um, to enter more participants. It, I think it also has to come from the grassroots as well, um, especially with maybe some extra development work done into training camps um, for, for female athletes. I think um, we have some absolute superstars within para table tennis who are fine examples, um, especially Natalia Partica, uh, Melissa Tapper. They're, they're probably the most high profile players within para table tennis who have um even kelly van zon um some absolutely amazing players that um uh, are great examples that you know anything is possible um i think the, the opportunities to uh, market um stories like this um would would be a big benefit to um increasing participation Okay. Um, Alejandra, I know that you have been doing an amazing job uh, with the females in the Argentinian team. Uh, what is your um, opinion regarding this matter? Uh, you, you're muted again. There are a lot of things and, and points we have to, to see. For example, promotion in tournaments. It could be promotion about money. I'm thinking in the way that... Uh, give discounts to women participation that could be something good to help people to um, 
uh, give the opportunity to countries to send women to tournaments. Uh, education mm -hmm. is, is very important. Uh, include include the uh, gender in all educations. Okay. All different types of education. Inclusion uh, in competition. What Trevor said, I was thinking exactly the same to do a mixed double competition or, or, or some kind of team competitions where you need the participation of a woman. So the country should be interested in get a medal and should be interested in develop a, a women table tennis. To have role models, more media um, exposure. Uh, and I will I will say something, for example, now, uh, today, uh, <coughs> today in the afternoon, there will be a gender conference in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And they, when they ask me to to me uh, about this, I say no. Uh, we have to give the opportunities to the players to talk and to give their point of view. So in this conference, we participate a female player from Argentina. So we have to open this door and to give to them this opportunity because they are there and they want to to talk. Uh, and it's very important that women with disability participate and talk. Okay. Yeah. And also, uh, men coaches uh, sometimes have to have more em empathy with women mm -hmm. because it's very common that if you are a female coach, you are more women. So this should be the same for for men coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'm I'm looking forward to the um, uh, conference this afternoon. I am I am registered for that. I I see that there are a lot of participants. Um, I I think that it will be a a, a good meeting. So um, we have reached the um, uh, questions that we have prepared, but um, we have still some a few minutes uh, for some question and answers that we collected from the registration forms. And uh, maybe we have uh, still uh, also some minutes uh, for some questions that we have received during the, um, uh, the webinar that we have been uh, ha hold holding uh, so far. Um, uh, would like I have some questions for um, for basically well they are quite variable. Um, the first one I would like to uh, address it to Shen Gu. Um, is uh, Doctor Gu still with us? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I was not sure. So um, we have received some questions. Um, uh, for example. Um, what happens uh, with uh, classification during this current pandemic? Is there any different protocols that we should follow? What uh, is um, foreseen uh, for the next few months? Honestly, we we need to discuss uh, what events will will continue, mm -hmm. and uh, the classification committee will discuss and uh, how we deal with new classification review and uh, to make sure the safety and also maintain the rights of prayers. And uh, I understand prayers want to go to Paralympics in 2021 in right classes, so we need to find a good solution. But at the moment, I can't give uh, good answers. So, so the committee need to need to see the the whole situation is stable. Then we will we will plan the classification opportunities for for prayers. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, then yeah, it seems uh, uh, obvious that we have to wait until competition is resumed because um, classification cannot be conducted without competition. Mm. Okay, and um, well, uh, Dr. Suzuki from Japan uh, sends uh, sent us a question. Uh, there will there be any changes in the classification system for next year? Uh, generally speaking, no. At the moment, no. But after at, after Paralympic Games, it may be possible. But we haven't get approval from the the classification committee, and also get approval from ITTF. PTT. So if we have any changes, we will let country know as early as possible so they can have proper uh, preparation. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Locke Singh Bagri uh, sent us a question that I think it will be uh, better to be answered by Trevor and Alejandra. Um, at the grassroots levels, um, should we, what should we do to encourage para athletes to be part of the table tennis family, to get recognition in the society and to be inspiration icons for all? Trevor? Um, I, I think it's about um, being included um, at your, your local club. Um, maybe there is uh, some athletes at the local club who maybe don't feel a, a part of the, the whole team. Uh, I think um, maybe some other coaches or something uh, in that club are, are educated at, um, about um, para table tennis then they'll be able to make the necessary adjustments to, to make everyone uh, feel welcome at the club. Uh, I think one thing important with sort of in integration in, in, in um, all countries throughout the world is um, including para events at local tournaments. Um, mm. I think that's one thing that we do really well in Australia. Uh, whenever I go to play in a, in a state tournament, I can play an open, I can play um, divisions, and I can also compete in para. Uh, I think this is really, really important um, that uh, competitions are, are held um, together. Um, yeah. Okay. And um, um, we have a very interesting question for Alejandra uh, from uh, related to coaching. Uh, Ramsey, uh, Ramsey Mabruk uh, sends a question. Uh, which says, uh, does the coach need to have more knowledge in a sport psychology than training in para table tennis in comparison to an able body? Um, not for me, for me, no, for me, no, because uh, I, I do not want to put these differences that psychology is, is different. And on the other hand, when when we speak now about psychology is like an, a specific topic in training and and you have to be uh, uh, you have you need to have the knowledge i'm not a psychologist so you need in your team a psychologist to help you in in that way so uh, you can have a psychology psychologist in your team or the player can have their own uh, professional to help him but when we are talking about a player who is starting to play. So uh, you need time and you need patience uh, at the, when you have beginner players. And that is the same for everybody. So uh, maybe you are worried about uh, some kind of frustration or, or they can lose the motivation at the beginning because uh, they cannot get results faster. But this is the same in everybody. So if you have uh, a child, it's the same. You, you, you don't want to, to lose the, the motivation. So we have to change our mind and not try to uh, look at the players with a disability different. So it's the same motivation, uh, the same feeling. You can have uh, an everybody player that um, do not have uh, high motivations and you also have to work on this. So uh, mm. just, uh, we have to break this wall and think of them that is, is the same. And not to enter in, in fields that are not from coaches. I'm not a psychologist, so I'm a coach. If I need the help of a, of a psychologist because I can see one of my players need it, so I have to go to the professional. Um, well, this is a, a message that I have been um, uh, I have been hearing uh, from different sources, and I think it is very important to uh, stress it out. Um, focus. Let's focus on the things that are the same, and uh, there are uh, we shouldn't focus. Uh, we shouldn't put our eyes all the time on the things that are different. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I have one additional question uh, sent by Matthew Collins from Ireland. I think that this will be for Dr. Gu. Um, 
Uh, Matthew Collins is asking about class 11 classification and he asked uh, if uh, can uh, intellectual impairment classification be done without the participation of INAS membership? Yes. Oh. This question I cannot answer. This is more like a political question. <laughs> because uh, IPC, ITTF, and uh, also INERS have some agreement, and uh, I only follow the rule. So probably Pablo can also share your opinion. <laughs> okay, I was afraid that it was it was going to bounce me back. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, we count with the help of uh, INAS, which now uh, is an organization which has uh, changed its name to Virtus because they are the experts in the intellectual uh, impairment. So, uh, as Alejandra mentioned before, uh, she is a coach, she is not a psychologist. I have uh, heard a lot to Dr. Gu that uh, he is a physiotherapist, he is not a medical doctor, or he is not a. So, uh, we should focus on what we are experts on and intellectual impairment is a very complex matter even from the psychology and um, point of view so we rely on uh, virtues because they are the experts on the area and uh, we focus on the sport well um we have reached uh, the one hour uh, that we had in plan, but before we um, uh, before we finish, I would like to address also uh, a question that we have received from different people. Quite a lot of different people have sent us uh, questions related to classifiers training. Mm -hmm. So um, questions about when we will have more classification seminars, what is the plan for uh, classification training in the future? And uh, for this question, I would uh, like to take advantage of the presence of uh, the ITTF Head of Education here, uh, Ramon Ortega. And um, I would like to, um, well, to address this question to him, uh, uh, Ramon. Uh, could you give us a very brief uh, summary of some very quick details about what are the plans for uh, classifiers training in the near future? Okay, thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, I'm really very happy that many people from panelists, but also from the attendees that are asking about education. So just as um, you know, the strategic plan 2018-2024, there are different strategic priorities, and one of those is high performance and development. And inside that one, there are different objectives, and four different objectives of those ones are related to education. So objective, one objective is related to increase the numbers of coaches, of uh, match officials and also to, to increase the technical level. So happy to read in the chat that Ella was writing about the level of the classifiers. So also objective uh, number, another objective is related to have education with world standard classes, with high standard class. And another objective is related uh, partner with leading technologies. Okay, another one is related to the coach uh, accreditation scene. So just um, taking all this package and how this is coming related to classifiers, we have developed, developed four different levels in classification. Mm. And we already developed the different competencies for all these four levels. And already we developed the syllabus of level one. So the, the level one will be a level one that it will be completely online. So there will not be face to face. So how to increase numbers? This is one way that we, we, we have. So just now we are developing the contents of this level one course. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... 
Well, uh, thank you all. I would like to uh, just um, wrap up a little bit this uh, webinar by th um, thanking the three uh, panelists. Uh, I know especially for Trevor, it's uh, a late night. For uh, Shengu, it's, uh, he's been working all day and he's been, he has extended his working hours. So thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I'm very happy about the experience. I was mentioning before we uh, started the webinar that we have uh, around 150 uh, people registered from uh, more than 50 countries. This is a proof that uh, paratable tennis is very universal, is played all over the world. We have uh, people interested in uh, paratable tennis classification for from the five continents, and this is a very, very good uh, news from, from us. So without uh, um, anything from my side, um, I would like to uh, give the floor to Cassia to close the webinar. So hello again. Uh, thank you very much. We had a very good, uh, a little bit more than one hour. Uh, my sincere thanks to uh, to Pablo uh, who moderated this uh, fantastic uh, discussion uh, to the great panelists uh, for sharing your experience knowledge uh, and also personal insights uh, with all of us uh, to our HPD team and to you to all attendees uh, who dedicate your time um, and be with us uh, on on this webinar uh, I would like to uh, invite all of you also to uh, to our next uh, webinar, which will be next Wednesday, at 24th of June at 1 p.m. And the topic is the perspective and power of young champions. So again, thank you very much and uh, have a good day to all, night, morning. Uh, see you soon. See you next time. <laughs>